It's a Man Crush Monday. Join Professor Buzzkill as he crushes on men from history who deserve more fame and glory. Hello, it's the old professor here with a Man Crush Monday for this week. Imagine you've been a pioneering medical doctor, but you've had a nervous breakdown and are being sent to an asylum for treatment. Now, despite all the work you've done, your innovations in medical treatment have not been recognized and accepted by the contemporary medical community. In fact, the medical establishment has more or less ridiculed you and tried to run you out of the profession. The stress has been too much, and now you're in the hands of the staff at a mental asylum. But it's 1865, and the treatment for a nervous breakdown is more or less like being sent to a prison. The guards at this particular asylum have beat you severely in an attempt to get you to comply with asylum treatment, and I'm putting treatment in quotation marks here. This treatment kills you within two weeks, and you're only 47 years old. It's hard to imagine someone packing more into a short life than Ignaz Semmelweis to have a more tragic ending and yet to have been proven so right in the end. He's our Man Crush Monday for this week and although well known now in his native Hungary and among experts in the history of his medical field, that is the germ theory of disease, I think he deserves more historical attention. Born to a prosperous merchant family in Hungary in 1818, Ignaz Semmelweis got his medical degree in Vienna in 1844. He eventually practiced and specialized in obstetrics, the study of pregnancy and childbirth, and worked at the Vienna General Hospital starting in 1846. Now, two maternity clinics had been set up there to offer free medical care to poor women and to try to combat infanticide. Now, this was a problem because a great many poor women and prostitutes used it, that is, they used infanticide as a tragic, tragic solution to the problem of unwanted pregnancies. The clinics also served to train medical students and midwives in how to best deliver children and care for new mothers. The problem was that the clinic that trained doctors, the first clinic, as it was called, had a high incidence, roughly 10%, of mothers dying from something called childbed fever. The the incidence of death from childbed fever was much lower, 4%, in the second clinic. However, the second clinic concentrated on the training of midwives. Midwives only worked with pregnancy and childbirth, and were not trained as medical doctors. Those trained medical doctors who delivered babies, however, in the first clinic, also dealt with all sorts of other medical problems. And part of those doctors' training was to dissect and study corpses of those who had recently died. Remember, this was the 1840s and 1850s, before the germ theory of infection and germ theory of disease was discovered and accepted. So the rate of maternal death in the medical doctor's clinic, Clinic 1, versus the rate of maternal death in the clinic run by midwives, Clinic 2, was a troubling issue in the medical community. It seemed inexplicable that a clinic run by common midwives would have a higher survival rate than a clinic run by gentlemen doctors. And the relatively poor survival rate of the doctor's clinic became a fairly well-known fact to the public, even women at the margins of society who were desperately in need of help. Often, poor Viennese women would ask not to be sent to the doctor's clinic, clinic one, where they feared they would catch childbed fever. They begged to be admitted to the midwife's clinic, Clinic 2, because they had heard of the higher survival rate there. In fact, some desperate women resorted to giving birth in the street rather than enter the doctor's clinic. This rising incidence of street birth 
drove Semmelweis to consider the childbed fever problem very seriously. He studied all the practices in both clinics carefully, but could not understand why the midwife one was so much safer. Each clinic followed exactly the same medical procedures. The only difference was that the doctors delivered babies, the doctors and the medical students training to become doctors, they delivered babies in clinic one, and the midwives delivered babies in clinic two. Semmelweis couldn't identify the reason for higher childbed deaths in clinic one until the answer started to reveal itself after an accident. One of Semmelweis's doctor colleagues died after getting a small cut from a scalpel during a post-mortem examination and training session in the hospital's morgue. Semmelweis did the autopsy on the dead doctor and found almost identical pathology that had been causing the deaths of the mothers in Clinic 1. Eventually, Semmelweis theorized that medical doctors and medical students were carrying cadaverous particles, or cadaverous matter, both of these are in quotes because they were the terms used at the time, what we would think of as germs. They were carrying these things with them on their hands from the autopsy room to maternity clinic one where they delivered the babies. This was the only difference he could find between the treatments and the treatment environments even in clinic one with the medical doctors and in clinic two with the midwives. The midwives obviously hadn't been examining dead bodies as part of their medical training and weren't carriers of anything that could give mothers childbed fever. And Semmelweis thought that the only way to combat the cadaverous matter that traveled to the doctor's maternity clinic was for those doctors and medical students to clean and disinfect their hands carefully and extensively. Ordinary soap and water proved to be ineffective, and so Semmelweis came up with a chlorinated lime and water solution that successfully killed the germs from the cadavers. Clinic One, the doctor's clinic, started using this disinfecting, this disinfecting method in mid-1847, and the mortality rate from childbed fever dropped to zero. Zero within two months. Now, despite the obvious success of this disinfection method, Semmelweis couldn't convince most of the medical community in Vienna and in Europe generally that germ transmission was the cause of childbed fever. Most doctors believed that other factors, such as the, you know, quote, imbalance of the four humors, end quote, in the body, the the old way of thinking about how the body worked, the uncleanliness of the mothers themselves, and the general poor health of women in the free maternity clinics were to blame. Semmelweis published his findings and tried to get his new methods adopted, tried to get other doctors to test them out. But he was more or less ridiculed by the medical establishment. Many doctors thought that hand washing was was beneath them because it implied that men of their social status could be unclean. Now, the other major obstacle to the adoption of Semmelweis's methods included what is now called the, quote, belief perseverance. It's a psychological reluctance to accept new ideas and to reinforce belief in traditional explanation, especially effectively doubling down on old ideas. And then this led to what was later described as the Semmelweis reflex. That's rejecting new ideas automatically, almost as a reflex, whenever they came out. It was as, it was as if something in, in Semmelweis's new hand-washing protocol threatened the whole history of doctors' training in Europe, and they rejected it. Now, he left the Vienna Hospital in 1849 and went home to Budapest, where he worked in similar hospitals and had similar success with his new techniques. And Semmelweis and his, his, some of his followers continued to publish the results of their new procedures. But the reaction of most of the medical establishment at the time was so hostile and so personal towards Semmelweis himself 
that it began to affect his own mental health. By the late 1850s, he became extremely depressed. And he may, in fact, have been suffering from a case of early onset Alzheimer's disease. The stress of being so extensively rejected and ridiculed by his professional colleagues drove him to the nervous breakdown I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. By 1865, the breakdown was causing him to act in very extreme, almost maniacal ways. His family and a couple of personal doctor friends sort of tricked him into going into a mental asylum. And we, when he tried to leave or escape, the guards began to beat him severely. They eventually put him in a straitjacket and had him placed in solitary confinement for periods of time. He died within two weeks from the gangrene he had gotten from one of the wounds he suffered from the guards' beatings. The doctors, by the way, who replaced him at the hospital in Budapest, the maternity doctors, did not continue Semmelweis' treatments, and death from childbed fever crept up again to their, if you will, pre-Semmelweis levels. Only in the late 1860s and through the 1870s did Semmelweis' ideas and treatments begin to be recognized. Louis Pasteur in France and later Joseph Lister in Britain proved the germ theory of disease. Now, they faced similar opposition from their own medical establishments, but by that time, the evidence they had mounted, combined with the evidence that Semmelweis had, had been tested and retested and finally gained acceptance by the end of the 19th century. Semmelweis's genius and sacrifice was, as I say, gradually accepted and celebrated in the 20th century. Budapest is now home to Semmelweis University, which specializes in medicine, healthcare, and health policy. There's a Semmelweis Clinic for Women in Vienna. There are statues to, to him in Budapest, in Vienna, Toronto, and Tehran, the University of Tehran. And his image has appeared on coins and stamps in his, in his native Hungary, where he's now regarded as a national hero. You buzzkillers should read Dr. Theodore Obenshain's wonderful study of Semmelweis's life and work entitled Genius Belabored, Childbed Fever and the Tragic Life of Ignaz Semmelweis. It's available, as always, on the Buzzkill bookshelf. And as a Buzzkill bonus, you should also go to our YouTube channel. In addition to the video of this episode, we have put a copy of a Hollywood short subject film made about Ignaz Semmelweis's work. From 1838 and entitled That Mothers May Live, it celebrates Semmelweis's contribution to medicine and medical history. Go to youtube.com, search for the Professor Buzzkill channel, and subscribe to it while you're there. Talk to you next week.